Welcome, Pewter Report readers and listeners, to another edition of the Pewter Report podcast, energized by Celsius. I am John Ledyard from pewterreport.com. Along with me today, the one and only, ladies and gentlemen, Marcus Mosher himself, host of Locked On Cowboys. He covers the Raiders, he covers the Cowboys, he is a noted Cowboys enthusiast, and he has a deep, Deep hatred for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He is our guest on the Pewter Report podcast today. Marcus, we appreciate you taking the time to join us today, man. Absolutely. I'm, I'm just kind of stunned that you just didn't introduce me as a Steeler hater. I would have taken that. That sounds fantastic to me. I'm, I think on my tombstone, that's what it's going to be written. Steeler hater for life. Listen, this is probably the closest you'll ever get to being a guest on a Steelers show. I mean, this isn't a Steelers <laughs> show, but I'm a Steelers guy. But if That's anybody true. follows Marcus on Twitter, and Bucks fans, you'll probably love this, actually, because y'all love to hate on the Steelers in the chat, too, to get me riled up. But Marcus is a deep hatred for the Steelers. And it stems, Marcus, right, because you're from... What, the Erie area? And so yeah. you've grown up around Steeler fans. I, I've grown up around Yinzers my whole life, and I think that's the biggest thing. It's it's not necessarily the team that I hate. It's the fans. Um, John, and I'm sure you know a little something about oh, that. <laughs> oh, I do, dude. I completely – trust me. When I heard that you say that, I was like, okay, I actually completely yeah. understand like why <laughs> why this is the case. Yeah, it's, for it's, not, the, it's not the team. It's just uh, you, everybody knows a couple obnoxious fans when you live around – 10 million of them you understand right oh yeah it is uh man i'm telling you steelers fans can definitely be that way and they <laughs> they do drive me crazy a little bit i've kind of jokingly said this to bucks fans but i really uh, enjoy covering the bucks in large part because <laughs> they're not steelers fans yeah. and they have a different perspective and so uh i definitely understand what you're saying when you say that we are excited that we've got we've got a lot to dive into today namely week one cowboys mm -hmm. box we have not had a cowboys person on because we've had such kind of a non uh, or a nonstop slate of guests and other fit topics to cover, but we haven't really had anybody on to talk about this week one season opening matchup. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, excited to get to that. We'll talk about what might be the two best wide receiver cores in the league between Dallas and uh, Tampa Bay and how a recent high pedigree website may have been disrespecting those receiving cores a little bit. So we'll talk about that state of the NFC. We'll get into as well and just kind of what, to expect from that conference this year as it really appears to be a conference that just a lot up in the air with it right now. So all that's coming on the show today and it's all brought to you by our good friends over at Celsius. Celsius powers active lives every day with essential functional energy. Sparkling strawberry guava is the drink of choice today. Healthy energy accelerates metabolism, burns body fat. Cannot say enough good things about Celsius. No sugar and no letdown. It gives you the energy and it gives you healthy stuff without the sugar, without the letdown. It is a game changer, folks. Great for me in my early morning workouts. I love it. Make sure you check out Celsius. You can go to Celsius.com, look at all the flavors that they have. You can find Celsius at an increasing number of stores around you. But if you need to use the store locator over at Celsius.com to check out some locations, see if they have it, definitely go ahead and do that as well. All right, Marcus, we got, uh, man, I mean, first thing I want to ask you about is the Dallas Cowboys. Dak Prescott's coming back from a significant injury, that broken ankle, that really derailed everything. Yes, there were some disappointments already in the Cowboys season when he went down. But it felt like things were going out the window with the offensive line injuries. Now Dak's back, Tyron Smith's back, Zach Martin's back at his correct position, Leal Collins is back. The receiving core, especially C.D. Lamb, um, has another year of experience. There's a, a second year under Mike McCarthy's offense. We'll get to the defense in a second. Offensively, though, what should the expectations be for Dallas and really for Dallas as they go into this week one game against Tampa Bay? Yeah, the offense should be really good. And, John, I think it would be a pretty big disappointment if they didn't finish inside the top five. And, frankly, I think they should finish closer to number one than number five. When you invest mm -hmm. this many resources into your quarterback, your running backs, all those offensive linemen, all those receivers, this is a team that needs to score 30-plus points per game. I think they can do it. They actually led the league in points per game in 2019. Uh, I think they were on pace to do it with Dak Prescott last year. 
Yeah. I expect them to be one of the best offenses in the league. And I think they're going to need to because that defense is uh, not good, as the kids would say, right? It's, they're going they're going to have to win shootouts. It's their only way to potentially compete with the better teams in the NFC. I was going to ask you, uh, we'll get to the defense in a second, but I feel like the Dallas Cowboys offense, the question, and this seems weird if you follow the Cowboys over the last five, six years or so, the offensive line, is that the question in the offense? I mean, you obviously have Zeke and Dak and the wide receivers, and you kind of know what's there in the tight end group. It's not maybe they don't have a Gronk, or you know, but they have some still talent there with Blake Jarwin, Dalton Schultz. So, But this offensive line, obviously they get Tyron Smith back, but he struggled with injuries for a while, so fair to have some questions there. But Al Collins' injury was significant this past year, and so he's got to get back to where to the level he was at too. So obviously if they're healthy, two stud tackles. But then you still got Connor Williams. has kind of been this underachievement. Tyler Biotis, you know, where's where's he at where do you see this offensive line compared to some of the years where we've said oh this is the best group in the league yeah i don't think they're at that level anymore right i mean these guys have just gotten older between martin and between tyron smith and all their injuries they lost travis frederick lot last year due to retirement so they're still trying to figure out what to do at center i think connor williams is maybe a little underrated but he's in the final year of his contract Mm -hmm. uh we'll see about lyle collins who missed the entire year last year let's see what kind of shape he's in after having hip surgery, but uh, the Cowboys feel good about their offensive line. They feel good about their depth. If they can even play, you know, inside the top 10, I think they're going to be just fine. It's, it's certainly the biggest question mark on the offense, (laughs) but relative to their other needs on the other side of the ball, it's not a concern at all. Right. Okay. So let's talk about this other side of the ball. There's a ton of new pieces. I mean, and there's there's obviously some talent. I mean, I think everybody's excited, wants to see more of Trayvon Diggs. There was bad last year. There was some good too. He made some turnover play, mm-hmm. uh, created some turnovers. They were really impressive. There were flashes of kind of everything. Then they got hurt. And so Trayvon Diggs, you know, is Calvin Joseph stepping right into this starting lineup? Their second round pick that is coming from a zone heavy scheme and maybe mm-hmm. still in one. Cowboys have talked about playing more man. I think if I've seen that, what's what's the fit like there? And is Joseph projected to be a starter? Yeah, the Cowboys are going to lean on boss man fat, his rapper name right. uh, to, to, to be a starting corner. And it's going to be quite a jump coming from Kentucky playing only nine, you know, starting nine career games. But They really don't have many other options on the outside. I think Anthony Brown and Jordan Lewis are going to compete for uh, slot snaps. Trevon Diggs on the outside. They need Joseph to play well because there's just not a lot of options. John, listen, it's it's a bad secondary. They know that. It's a very young secondary. They don't need this unit to be a top 10, top 15 unit to be successful this year. They just need to see improvement, and they can't be – awful right if they can be even just slightly below average i think they'll be fine my concern is if they have any injuries at all if trevon Diggs takes a step back if kelvin joseph isn't ready to play they could be in big big trouble early in the season yeah that's i mean i mean i look at the group as a whole and i'm like okay why isn't this a group i know they have all these linebackers (laughs) and they want to move keanu neal to linebacker it seems like not that he's like the game changer safety in the league or anything but I, I mean, we watched them for years, obviously, in Atlanta as Bucks people. And we've, seen, you know, it seems like to me that Keanu Neal could help the secondary hit strong safety, but they're moving him to linebacker. What's the deal there? Yeah. So the Cowboys signed Neal with the intention to play him at weak side linebacker. And then they draft Michael Parsons at number 12. Yeah. They draft Jabril Cox, you know, in the fourth round, who I think is probably a weak side linebacker in the NFL. Yeah. Leighton Vander Esch is coming back. Jalen Smith is coming back. Uh, Dan Quinn has basically talked. They only ever want to play two linebackers. So it seems like you have about two names too many there. I- I'm really curious to see how it all plays out. I have absolutely no idea how they're going to handle this. And maybe the idea is, John, hey, we're going to a 17-game schedule. Linebackers get hurt. Let's just load up on these guys because we can't really trust Van Der Esch to stay healthy. We can't really trust Keanu Neal to stay healthy. We'll just Whoever's available, we'll play them and we'll figure it out later. Yeah, it's a wild situation. I mean, when I saw the Neil was like moving the linebacker, I'm like, what about? <laughs> and then they draft two, and everybody thought Cox was like the steal of the draft. Mm-hmm. You know, they've been saying so. It seems like you're right. Two two names, too many. Uh, we'll see what happens. Obviously, we've seen you know uh, before kind of what this defensive scheme has looked like at least in the past. And you know, you think that if Quinn's running a something similar, it's going to be again like you think Seattle. I mean, there was KJ Britt and Bobby Wagner on the field. You didn't really have a third linebacker on the field that much. So it is interesting. We'll see what happens. I actually 
of the opinion last year when I watched Atlanta secondary, this is a really bad group and Keanu Neal is clearly the best player in the group. Um, you know, and so yeah. I, I actually thought that was a good signing for them. And I thought Demonte KZ was a good signing too. And I guess we'll just kind of have to see how it all unfolds and how they all get on the field. But the, the, they're obviously relying a ton on Demarcus Lawrence. He's got a matchup. Let's, as we start to look at this week one specific slate, uh, he's got a matchup where he's, you know, Lawrence plays almost all his snaps at that left defensive end mm -hmm. spot. And Tristan Wirfs, obviously, at that right tackle spot. That is a heavyweight matchup if there ever was one, isn't it? I think so. I think that might be the best matchup in week one, regardless, because I think yeah. you can make a case right now, John. Tristan Wirfs, at worst, is what, a top three right tackle yeah. in the league? Top five? At worst, and, yeah. At worst. And I think Demarcus Lawrence is one of the most underrated players in the league. Agreed. He can win with power. He can win with a little speed. He's got length. I think that will be really fun. And then on that, uh, on the other side, Randy Gregory, uh, this is his first full offseason in his NFL career where he wasn't either preparing for the NFL draft or suspended. And Randy Gregory played really well in the mm -hmm. second half of the season. Donovan Smith is a really good left tackle. I think the, the matchup on the edge in this week one battle is going to be absolutely fantastic, and I could not be more excited about it. It's probably where the Cowboys need to win if you're, if they're going to stop mm. Tampa Bay's offense. You would think, you know that th there is some talent inside. I mean, obviously they're very hopeful about Tristan Hill and what he can bring to the table. I mean, I think Hill and, and Neville Gallimore, the fact that they didn't really, obviously they bring in Osa Digazua, but they didn't go out and like add a bunch of big names or anything like mm. that to the D line. They clearly they added some role guys, but they clearly still want. Gallimore and Hill to be developmental guys. Obviously, they're starting things out going up against one of the best interior offensive lines in the league in Tampa Bay. Is this a little bit of a – you're looking at young guys who have eh, – there's been some flashes with Gallimore and Hill, but certainly haven't proved worthy of their draft spots just yet. Obviously, there's still plenty of time, nobody burying them yet. But is this a matchup week one that's a little bit concerning considering the fact they haven't developed inside? Yeah, this is my biggest fear is that the interior of Tampa Bay's offensive line is just going to maul Dallas because I like Tristan Hill, actually. I thought he was playing really well last year, but mm -hmm. he tore his ACL halfway through the season. I have no idea what he's going to look like in week one. Neville Gallimore had his moments, but he's just not a consistent run defender at all. Osa Odigizua is a 280-pound defensive tackle who really does his best work against the run. And then there's really nothing at the one technique outside of Brent Urban. So if if the Cowboys can figure out a way to generate any pressure in the interior of Tampa Bay's offensive line, I think they're gonna they're, they're gonna have some success. I just wouldn't count on it at all. Yeah, it, it is one of those spots where I'm like, man, if, now the good thing is there's two there's good news and bad news. The Bucks don't run the ball that much, yeah. and they have not really been this amazing rush team. They've not really needed to be, you know, the Arians passing mm -hmm. scheme and how that's been accomplished every single year. But it's never really been like this dominant rush scheme necessarily. The bad news is probably that they when they run, they run almost all between the tackles, and yeah. that's where the Cowboys kind of have question marks. So, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely going to be a, one of the matchups to watch. Kevin with a shout-out. Peter Report got the shout-out on Pat McAfee's show. Did see that today. Uh, there's been some Peter Report buzz uh, out there, uh, and so we appreciate all of you for drawing our attention to that. But uh, definitely Bruce Arians on the show yesterday. If you haven't had a chance, go back and listen. Arians had some some uh, great stuff to say just about Bucks roster. Great story about Leonard Fournette, which Fournette himself shared today and, and, and had some comments about, which was cool. Um, but Arians grateful for his time, as always, and then his insight, too. Go back and listen to yesterday's show if you want to get a, a little bit of a better taste for what that interview was like, but it was a really, really good time on the Peter Report podcast. Talking to Marcus Mosher here today, host of Locked On Cowboys. And Marcus, man, we this matchup in week one has everything I think the NFL really wants. At first, I was a little skeptical. Then I was like, but the only reason I was skeptical was I was like, this Cowboys defense might be so bad still week one that mm -hmm. this game could get out of hand. But then I was like, man, the Cowboys offense, it's loaded. This could be like one of the highest scoring games of the year. And that's, I mean, I know the Bucks defense is good, but it's still a group that gave up some points at times last year. Yeah, I, I still wish this game was later on in the year because I, was I, ask just, you that. I, yeah, I just worry about Dak Prescott and being rusty, right? Not playing for so long, coming back from that injury. You do wonder if there's going to be a little bit, you know, some hesitancy there. Is he going to be as willing to get outside the pocket and run? I'm not sure. Uh, but with all the weapons the Cowboys have, I think that they will find a mismatch at some point. 
And John, we saw last year, the Cowboys can be down 20 points in a game in the second half, and it still doesn't matter, right? They came back yeah. against the Falcons. Uh, they nearly pulled off an impossible game against the Browns. So this one might get ugly early, but that doesn't mean the Cowboys can't come back. They are they are such an explosive offense. They have so many guys that can make plays down the field. But I do think this game might be a little closer than most people anticipate. Oh, I, I agree with you completely because I don't know, you know, coming out, r- hitting the ground, running defensively is not something the teams do every single year. We saw last year. I mean, defense has got blitzed out of the yeah. game. And I know last year was a weird offseason, but I think the league is going to move more and more and more in that direction where defenses are going to have to play catch up and then kind of hit their stride later in the season. Offenses are going to come out slinging it all over the yard. I think it's going to be a really high scoring game. I think it's going to be a blast to watch. I was I'm interested in what you said there about wishing it were later in the year because you're right. Cowboys defense really bad last year. This year they added a bunch of players. Uh, there are some more talent in the room, but is it all going to come together in time to be able to stop an offense that'll be returning everybody in Tampa Bay? That that will be one of the bigger challenges I think of the season. Let's talk about the Cowboys as a whole and then expand this conversation to the NFC. Cowboys obviously down year last year, and it was not really what the expectation level was for them. Injuries contributed really a lot to that, especially with how bad the East was. Good chance they would have won it even struggling. Um, but they didn't, and now you go into this year, Washington looks improved, especially quarterback um, with Ryan Fitzpatrick. The Giants roster is really good. There's still the big Daniel Jones question mark. Philly looks lost, but <laughs> Dallas, where do they stack up here? Would you consider them the East favorite? I mean, I think they have to be by default, right? Because they just have the best quarterback, right? And I think you can even make the case they have the best coach in the division. And uh, it's not to say that the Cowboys are a Super Bowl contender, but when you have a top seven, top 10 quarterback, you should win your your division when the next best quarterback is Ryan Fitzpatrick by a lot, right? (laughs) Yes. Like, I, I think I think 10 and 7 is very likely. And I don't necessarily think it's going to be at all that impressive 10 and 7. They should win five or six of their games in their division. We'll see how they do outside of the division and in the conference. But, yeah, I think it would be a pretty major disappointment if the Cowboys didn't win this division by at least a couple games. So what? It, what's a realistic number of wins for Dallas this season, do you think? I, I think the goal should be 11 or 12, but I think 10 mm-hmm. is probably the most likely. Okay. So what, 10 and 7? 10 and 7. 10 10 and and seven. seven. Okay. All right. That seems pretty fair to me. I, I could see them getting to 11, too. It really, it, like you said, somewhat depends on the defense, but if you got to be better in one area, offense or defense, and I'm taking offense for sure. Um, so I think that that bodes well for them, at least. And like you said, that division, you have the best quarterback by a lot by in far. that division. Yeah that should carry a ton of weight. I think it's a great point by you, and I think that's something that we need to consider when figuring out who's going to win that division. I see a lot of talk for Washington, see some talk for the Giants improved roster. At the end of the day, I like Ryan Fitz. I don't like Daniel Jones. I don't know if that does it quite enough. So NFC-wise, uh, we're uh, let's pretend we're in a – Aaron Rodgers is on the Green Bay <laughs> Packers world. Do you think Dallas is kind of like a – so they win the East maybe, they're the – fourth or you know is that some seed like that yeah, and, and then there's a hopefully you make noise in the playoffs yeah i mean i think they're they're pretty clearly a playoff team but i don't think they're at the level of tampa bay green mm-hmm. bay and even i i think the rams are going to be really good this year i, I think they're the next tier down but that doesn't necessarily mean that they can't compete with those teams right if they get into a game and they score 30 points and their offense is humming sure i could see them competing mm-hmm. with those guys but they're just not as talented as Tampa Bay and Green Bay. They're just not as well-rounded. I think it's going to take at least a year for Dan Quinn to implement his defense, for them to upgrade that talent. Uh, But again, anything is possible. If Dak can stay healthy, he can play at the level that he did in the first five games last year. I wouldn't be surprised if they're a tough out in the NFC. Right. No, good points. Uh, Some questions from the audience. If you guys have any questions, by the way, I see some, I'll get to all of them. And then uh, but if you have other questions in there, just let me know and I'll throw them up here and ask Marcus. Jack wants to know, can we ask what the main scheme changes were in the offense from Garrett to McCarthy? So we know some of the problems maybe that happened under mm-hmm. Jason Garrett. You can go into those if you want to. Did you see the swings that you needed to see schematically to feel good about Mike McCarthy? Or do you enter this season with a lot of questions even about the coaching of the offense? No, I actually don't worry about the coaching at all. I mean, oh, the, the scheme didn't necessarily change, but what changed was the play sequence. Sequencing, right. It wasn't a run on every single first down from mm-hmm. Mike McCarthy, like we saw from Jason Garrett. We th- saw them 
throwing the ball down the field. We saw more play action. We saw more motion than we ever saw under Jason Garrett. We saw just them being more aggressive in general, right? Not settling for long field goals, not settling for field goals inside the red zone. Hey, if, if it's fourth and three from the three yard line, why kick a field goal? Let's go get the touchdown. If worst case yeah. scenario, we're pinning our opponent back inside their own five yard line. I think that's what has me the, the most excited. And they won games last year, John, with uh, uh, Andy Dalton at quarterback. They almost beat your Pittsburgh Steelers with yeah. Garrett Gilbert, who was on the team nine days before he made that start. They were competitive the, with Ben. The eleven and zero Pittsburgh Steelers. The, the eleven and zero, and they came within a few yards of winning that game. So. I actually think the coaching staff did a heck of a job of keeping yeah. them competitive because if you remember correctly, they had a chance to win the division in week 17 last year, mm -hmm. despite how bad they were. So yeah. I am very encouraged by what I saw from not only Mike McCarthy, but also Kellen Moore, their offensive coordinator. What was the what was the biggest thing defensively? I mean, it just felt like they were they were so pathetic early in the season. Then obviously things got a little bit better. Is Mike Nolan to blame for all that? Where they did they just? I mean, obviously there were talent holes too. There's young players, but it, man, it just felt like that group was hopelessly lost uh, early in the season. Yeah, I mean, part of it was they tried to switch schemes in a COVID year where they mm. didn't have mini camps. They only had nine training camp practices to implement the scheme, and then halfway through the season, they tried to change everything up. They tried to play more man, uh, and then they had a bunch of injuries at cornerback. So it just seemed like it was doomed from the start. The Cowboys kind of hit the reset button this offseason. They went to a simpler defense that's going to allow them to play faster. Their talent's still an issue, but I do think a simpler scheme is going to be better yeah. for them long term. That will be interesting. A, a lot of respect for Dan Quinn, certainly in NFL circles. I think recently his defense is struggling a little bit, have created some cause for concern. But again, you go to a new place and we'll just have to see how everything goes uh, there. Obviously, a defense the Bucs are going to be very familiar with, so we'll see if that uh, has a role in week one. Kevin asks, could this be a make or break year for Zeke? He had such a high start to his career, but fallen off a bit. I mean, not that I get he's still a good player, I think, but I get I think what Kevin's saying is that it doesn't seem like he is the game changer that he was early in his career. That's a tough question because his salary is completely guaranteed over the next two years. So I don't see the Cowboys moving on from him at any point soon. Mm. But is there a chance that maybe they lessen his workload and we see more of Tony Pollard, who played really well last year? I think so. I think the Cowboys are going to a style of offense that I think Tony Pollard just fits better. So if Zeke can't be explosive and can't make plays out of the backfield, yeah, I do think there's a chance that we're not going to ever see the Ezekiel Elliott that gets 350 touches in a season. So if he if he can't stay healthy and if he can't be a little bit more explosive, yeah, I think the Cowboys eventually could move on from him sooner rather than later. Yeah, interesting. I, I hadn't thought that much about it, but I definitely can see your points to that end for sure. Tony wants – he's got a, just a message for us. The only <laughs> fan base more delusional than Cowboy fans are Steelers fans. So I just agree. A, just a <laughs> shot at both of us, Marcus. It is, it's true. Care. Just in general, Cowboys and Steelers fans are the worst. I'm not. I'm not going to disagree with that. We we all always believe that our team is great and that they're going to make the Super Bowl, or at least – the casual fan there. I can't say the same about us. We're yeah. we're we're pretty pessimistic about our team. <laughs> we, we are probably two of the more critical people about our teams. <laughs> but it's funny. I think I wouldn't disagree with Tony either. I'm with you. I think that both you know both are pretty delusional. And I think the media because Packer fans are pretty. Close. You could you, know, you could definitely throw Packers yeah. fans in there. Yes, and and the difference is I think Cowboys media does a better job of separating reality and expectations and kind of like setting a realistic world where Steelers media <laughs> forget about it, dude. Yeah. They're just whatever the, you know, they go, Oh, I thought every, you know, as soon as the Steelers win a game, score a touchdown. Oh, I thought the Steelers were done. You know, like it's like, okay. I thought Najee was a great pick at 24. Oh, yep. That's probably <laughs> contributed. That probably contributed yeah, yeah. to your Steelers hatred as much as the fans to honestly, the way the media uh, yeah, presents I mean, the team. It's, it's, it's it, we got used to it, right? It is what it is. That's right. It's very true. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Josh or Allen wants to know about uh, Ladarius Hamilton. Uh, he is our buck. Obviously, would be a long shot to make the roster, but there's been kind of like a running. As I've prefaced having somebody from the Cowboys on mm -hmm. for over a week now, there's been kind of this. Oh, you could ask about Ladarius Hamilton, and so it's become kind of a running joke. So, what's the deal, man? Ladarius Hamilton? Anything? Uh, does he bring anything to the table? I will say the Cowboys front office really, really liked him. I think he huh. was somebody that they believe could eventually maybe start for them. 
the coaching staff didn't have the same belief. And there was a little bit of some arguing about where he fits best. Is he, is he a defensive end? Is he an inside rusher? I, I don't think he's going to be a game changer or anything like that, but somebody that can hang on to the bottom of a roster and be a solid rotational player. I think so. They've got a few guys like in his mold, you know, Pat O'Connor, Jeremiah Ledbetter. They're guys that are kind of that mold a little bit. You play them on the edge, goal line packages. They can play inside a yeah. tight end, you know, I, I, you know, so you'd have to beat out those types of guys who've been around for a while now here. So still probably a long shot, but we'll see what happens with the Darius Hamilton. I asked John owning about him a little bit. Cause I know he watches edge mm-hmm. guys a ton and he was like, it's not very good. He's like, but I mean, he might, you know, he, he's tough and he tries hard. And <laughs> so it's like, say, it, sometimes that last defensive end on the roster, or defensive tackle, that's all they have to be. They have to be that tough, try hard guy. They're not the most talented players in the world. That's sometimes what you just need to do to, to hang on the NFL or on an NFL roster for three, four or five years. Yep. Very good point. Uh, recently, as of today, I think actually, uh, Pro Football Focus, by the way, has had, they've had a day. Okay. They they've had, had a they've day. Had a day. <laughs> Uh, you know, somebody runs wrote the, the goal every day on Twitter is never to be the main character. Well, pro football folks is the main character a lot. Uh, <laughs> Anthony triash is the main character a lot. Um, I don't know him, uh, but, uh, I, I love a lot of the people over pro football focus, not necessarily a huge fan of their wide receiver rankings that came up that went up today. Top 32 receivers in the league inside the top 10. Well, let's put it this way. Not inside the top 10 Marcus were Amari Cooper, Mike Evans, and Chris Godwin. No CD Lamb in the top 32. Somebody might be like, oh, he's a rookie. Well, there's rookies on here, and, and there's plenty of young players on here. And Tyler Boyd's number 32, and I think he's a good player. But CD Lamb, Michael yeah. Gallup, I yeah. think there's a conversation to be had there. So, your thoughts on the wide receiver core in Dallas, where it stacks up against the rest of the league and their exclusion mostly from this list? First and foremost, Mike Evans. I don't know how he's continuing to be this underrated. All the guy does is have thousand yard seasons every year of his career, and yet, we still don't call him a top 10 receiver. I, I don't get it. Um, back to the Cowboys and Bucks, though. I, I think these are the two best overall receiving cores in the NFL, right? I, can you name another team that is as talented and as deep as what both Tampa Bay and Dallas are? Right. There's other teams that have one and two, maybe. Atlanta, Russell Gage was impressive last year. But across three spots like that, that's well, and even look at Tampa Bay at the end of their roster right now. They have got Jalen Darden and Tyler Johnson, a, a draft Twitter favorite. Mm-hmm. Scotty Miller played pretty well last year. Yeah. Uh, the Cowboys obviously have CD Lamb as their third receiver. They've got Cedric Wilson, who played pretty well in spot mm-hmm. starts last year. Noah Brown is somebody that a lot of people like. Uh, these are just two really, really deep rosters. But no Cowboys and Bucks inside the the top. 10 that's that's tough uh, i'm gonna actually turn this one to you john who do you think is the better receiver right now between evans and amari cooper amari obviously struggles a little bit with drops but i think he's just such a great route runner evans yeah. can make plays down the field which one would you rather have oh, man this is such a good question and this will lead us into the biggest cop-out response ever you cannot legitimately rank all these receivers together and and just leave it like you need the context of usage, right? I mean, obviously, Amari Cooper is is a more uh, he in terms of pure separation, he is going to win you that battle more times than Mike Evans is in terms of being able to make great catches outside your frame, contested grabs. Mike Evans is going to win that battle mm-hmm. after the catch. You know, Mark Cooper is going to win that battle. You know, so it just kind of like really depends what you're looking for. Obviously, Evans is playing in the slot. He played the most snaps he'd ever played in the slot last year. Um, you know, I really value the separation aspect. So I yeah. honestly may go Amari Cooper in those situations, but it really would depend on what you're trying to, what you want to add, right? In your wide receiver room. Like that, I, that I, I think is a big part. Yeah. Of I think over the last couple of years, I've started to decide with you on that. Like separation matters more than the being able to c- catch every jump ball or 50, 50 ball down yeah. the field. I, I really appreciate how good Evans is at creating big plays, mm-hmm. but Amari's ability just to win inside in the slot on the outside with this, you know, off the line of scrimmage, it gets pressed is what I've, I've always really appreciated with him, but I don't think you can go wrong with either guy as your number one receiver. Yeah. Yeah. You really can't. And one of the things I've learned about Evans from being here and watching him every game, it's amazing how good of a route runner he is. Yeah. So he probably yeah, doesn't get underrated. enough credit for that. Yeah, yeah. Very, very underrated in that way. And then people always ask me in Tampa Bay, who would you rather have Chris Godwin or Mike Evans? 
And that to me is another mm. really difficult conversation because their usage couldn't be more different. I mean, Godwin plays that Larry Fitzgerald role in this offense. And so he is blocking a lot of the time. He is more of the underneath receiver. He uh, makes plays and he uh, gets the ball in his hands and makes plays. Evans is much more of a vertical threat in this offense. So it's really different usage. You know, I think Chris Godwin could probably do what Mike Evans does easier than Evans could do what mm. Godwin does. So maybe Godwin's more valuable because of that. But I don't think Godwin could do what Mike Evans does as well as Evans does it. And you could argue that Evans, what Evans does is the most valuable thing you can do, right? Touchdowns, big plays, that's the most valuable thing you can really get in the passing game other than maybe a, a, an elite yak receiver. But Well, that's why they fit so well together, right? It's yeah. because Godwin can do a lot of the dirty work. He can make plays after the catch. Uh, but he can also move around. He can play in the slot. He can play in the outside. He can win in the red zone too if you need him to. I mean, we saw that season it was 2019 where I yep. think he led the NFL in touchdowns. So uh, I think they're just a, a a perfect pairing together there in Tampa Bay. Yeah, they really are. It's been a been a blast to watch them. And I know this matchup in Week One, we could legitimately see at this point at that point in time. You know, I think the question Antonio Brown is what he is. Evans Godwin, those guys are kind of established. You mentioned mm-hmm. Scotty, um, but I think you could. See we could be at the point that next season, if we look at week eight, we could look back at week one and say six of the best 32 receivers in the league were on the field in that week one game. Without a doubt. And I think that's why this matchup is going to be so fascinating because the firepower that these two teams have is just absolutely crazy. Uh, let's just hope both offenses are coming out of the season functioning at 100% capacity because, man, this should be a game where 34, 31, like that would not surprise me at all. Oh yeah. I mean, it really, it really wouldn't. And that is what the NFL is absolutely banking on and hoping for. They, they don't want the Cowboys to have two turnovers and that defense to get shelled in the first half. That would be kind of uh, their worst nightmare there. So yeah, no, I love it. I think that it's great insights and great points by you there. Let's wrap up with this. Let me, you know, again, uh, I think that the NFC let's, let me just ask you before I say what I think you're going to stack the NFC right now. You're picking your, don't forget about the playoffs or, you know, who, who B2 and what the records are or whatever. But right now, like the five teams in the NFC that you feel like, are there five that really, that you feel like could represent the conference in the Super Bowl? Let's say Aaron Rodgers is on the Packers when week one comes around. Are there five you think could NFC represent the NFC in the Super Bowl? How would you stack those five in the NFC? Oh man. See, I, I don't know. There's five. I think obviously Tampa Bay is one green Bay with Rodgers is two. I, again, I love the Rams. I mm-hmm. think they are three. And then there's a big drop off. Like, do you trust Seattle in that roster? Because I don't necessarily think so. Dallas has too big of holes on defense. Will the 49ers with a rookie quarterback be able to win big playoff games? I have my doubts. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we're talking about a lot of teams that I think are probably a year or two away. So I really think right now the NFC is the top three. And then there's a pretty big gap between the next teams. I got to ask you this too. I've just realized this, but obviously for people who don't know, Marcus is the managing editor of Raiders wire. So he does a lot of, he, he's, he's both oh, your man. boy, John Gruden. And so what's going on, man? Is Gruden Mayock is, is that relationship about to come to an end? Give us the scoop here. It, I don't think that part is going to come to an end anytime soon. Now, I think there's some big disagreements between John Gruden and Mike Mayock and the rest of the scouting staff mm-hmm. between uh, Reggie's old guys, Reggie McKenzie's old scouts are still there. They have this old way of doing things. Mayock has his own way of doing things. And then Gruden just comes in there and picks whoever he wants. So I, I think Mayock and Gruden are fine. I don't know about the rest of the front office. That seems like it's a, a disaster waiting to happen. And it's already happened. So I guess I can't even say that. <laughs> I appreciate that honesty. No, I mean, you're going to need the Cowboys to stay healthy this season and produce in the NFCs to save you from the whatever the, is going on with the Raiders this I, year. Well, I, I just want to say last year could not have been a worse year. The Cowboys lost their quarterback in week five. The Steelers went 11-0 to start the season and the Raiders were the Raiders. So Hey, at least the Steelers <laughs> went out in embarrassing fashion. In the it, did, it did make it a little bit better. That made the whole year worth it for sure. Marcus Mosher, ladies and gentlemen, managing editor at Raiders Wire, host of Locked On Cowboys, Locked On Dynasty. You do writing for bookies and for Game Day NFL. I see you on there on the Clips Game Day NFL. And were you talking NBA in the clip the other day? Oh, of course. We got the NBA <laughs> playing games. We got the playoffs coming up. Just we've got to cover the basketball. It's I love really it. fun. I love it. He is wearing many hats and he's wearing all of them well. Uh, we've known each other for a long time, but just on social media, I don't we've never even met at an actual like event like the combine no, or senior bowl that's whatever, gonna change so. this year it's gonna change that's, this senior bowl oh good so you're getting out that you're gonna be oh, out there yeah oh good. we got okay. to 
Great. I'm looking forward to meeting you in person, but really appreciate you taking some time out of your busy schedule uh, to give us a great show today. Of course. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Marcus Mosher, ladies and gentlemen, I know my face looks very weird right now because I just removed Marcus from uh, the chat and I've got to change the take this background off. But yeah, no, I mean, I think he had great insight. I love talking to Marcus because he's very honest about the Cowboys. He he will say, oh, yeah, I think they're going to be better. I think they could win the East. But, you know, is this a team necessarily that's going to compete for a Super Bowl? Um, you know, I don't know if that's in the cards for them right now. And so appreciate that. Appreciate his insight and his look into that team. Man, talented group for sure on Dallas on offense. And that's the side of the ball to be more talented on. I just look at that defense and I say, oh, my goodness, week one could be. I mean, the Bucs could have 500 yards of offense if they're clicking. It's all about the Bucs. We know this. But, man, if they're clicking, that could be a, a really deadly game. So um, great stuff on the show today. Appreciate everybody who's, who's talking about the Arians uh, podcast from yesterday. That was great. Bruce Arians came on, was a guest, was really uh, shared a ton with us um, and, and gave us great insights and great stuff to continue to talk about this offseason, too, as we continue to kind of dive into all things Bucks. Um, we're trying to figure out, okay, this off season, what are the storylines? What are the battles? He talked about some of those and he talked about even what would be the biggest training camp battle for them uh, on the show. So go back to yesterday and listen to that show. Some really, really good stuff there. But want to mention another place that we talked. Locker Room is a social audio app that is changing the way we talk about sports. It's the only place for live audio conversations about the takes, rumors, news, and teams you care about. React to sports news as it happens. Gather all your friends and watch parties for the biggest games. Rep your favorite teams and find your community. Better Sports Talk is just a tap away. Download on the Apple App Store and join the conversation with Locker Room. Tonight, I'll be touching base with Josh Allen, I think, on the uh, Bucks Report later uh, in the evening. We're going to have to find some maybe halftime of that Warriors-Lakers game. Uh, I forget what time they're even playing, actually. I've been nervous. I'm, I'm a... I'm a Warrior Suns fan, so this game, obviously, if you follow the NBA, which most of you don't, has big implications uh, for me. I like both of those teams, uh, and they could end up playing each other um, if the if the Warriors win tonight. So um, we'll, we'll be on tonight in locker room. We'll be breaking down some of what Bruce has had to say um, and some of the other storylines from around the league. Antonio Brown set to sign you know, with the team, I think, officially later this week, hopefully, early next week at the latest, uh, depending on when they can get him in. So lots of good stuff coming up on there. So make sure you're plugged in and checking out Locker Room as well because they've got, uh, as always, uh, the place to be. Uh, download that app and, and follow Pewter Report. You'll get invited into those conversations as always. So great stuff on the show today. We appreciate Marcus and his insight tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern. We will have Mike Clay from ESPN on the show. He is going to talk about a bunch of stuff that he's been working on. Number one, Bucks have the best strength of schedule in the league. We're going to ask him how he gets how he gets to that point. How does he create that metric that tells him Bucks have the best strength of schedule in the league? Because he's not going off last year's records. His way is much more complicated, much more much different. Um, so we're going to ask him about that, his process to getting to the, why the Bucks have the best strength of schedule in the league. He believes the Bucks are repeating as Super Bowl champions. So we're going to ask him extensively about that, what he sees in the Bucks roster. And then he recently just dropped his projections for production for the year for Bucks players. Chad over to his Twitter, Mike Clay's Twitter, if you haven't seen it. Uh, and I retweeted it earlier today and shared it. Man, some good, interesting stuff in there. Um, he has thoughts about, might have a pair of 1,000-yard receivers, Antonio Brown around 800 yards. I think his projections were really close to accurate last season. Um, the O.J. Howard injury threw a wrench in things a little bit, but – he was pretty close to being on the money. So uh, worth checking out his projections at, at production for uh, the Bucks for this season. But he's going to be a guest on the show 1 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. So I know I'm sorry about that. I'm trying to make it work for Mike. I really want to have him on the show. He's excited. He loves our stuff. And he, he's excited to come on and give you some of his time. I know that time, the live time, doesn't necessarily work for everybody. So I do apologize for that. We'll be back on the 4 o'clock schedule next week. I know that messes with people too. But we appreciate everybody who rewatches and shares the podcast afterward. Um, because I think that's going to be um, going to be a blast too. Oh, some of you do watch the NBA. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to slander anybody. I I've been told that people in Tampa Bay don't aren't. There's not an NBA. There's not hardly any NBA fans around Tampa Bay. So maybe I'm wrong. I know all you don't live in Tampa Bay, so that might be a part of it. Charlie Abraham says he's right outside. Uh, right outside Oakland he loves the Warriors. So nice, I love it, Charlie. Let's go. Yeah, I became a Warriors fan by the way when when I was a kid. I was a teenager and Baron Davis. 
that that series where they took the uh, they beat the Mavericks. They were the eight seed, and the Mavericks were the one seed. And they beat them in that series, and I was like, man, an eight seed just beat a one seed <laughs> in the seven game and the best of seven. That's crazy. Um, and so I just I love their team. They were small ball. Don Nelson. They ran the floor, played offense. They were a blast to watch. And then they obviously lost to the Jazz in the next round, but oh well. Um, so go heat. We got some, okay. We got some NBA fans in here. So if I throw an NBA nugget out there once or twice, you already know I'm going to throw the NHL nuggets out there, especially if it ends up being bolts pens, uh, you'll get a little bit of that, um, too, as we move forward. So good wins last night for the bolts and the pens, Britt and I were, my wife and I were very happy. We watch, we always watch both games. And so it's been a lot of fun. So, all right, well, tomorrow we'll be back in the podcast, 1 PM Eastern. We'll have a lot to say. Appreciate everybody shouting us out and i pat mcafee show shout us out today um i believe uh the pro football talk shout us out today obviously in rap report on twitter appreciate all of them i know they're probably not gonna watch this but um I appreciate all them uh being able to just give them credit where credit to do that not something that always happens in the field and appreciate bruce aarons obviously for his time uh scott will be back on this podcast he wanted me to tell you all he is sick he is going through it right now he does not have much of a voice uh, it's not COVID related for anybody who's wondering. It's not COVID related, uh, but he is sick. He is getting better though. He's on the mend, feeling a little bit better today, but not much of a voice at all. But hopefully by the time Monday comes back around, he will be back on the show. But until then, we'll just keep crushing it with guests. And we appreciate all of you for tuning into another edition of the Pewter Report podcast. Out.